All right, can everybody hear me? I guess it, the sound is there. So here's the title of my talk, uh, Trying to Motivate Undergraduate Students for Communications. Uh, why do we want to do this, or why do we have to do this, or think we have to do this? Um, if I just start out here with the first slide, uh, that's sort of a combination of uh, two pages from, a, from typical communications textbooks that you use at the undergraduate level. So one of the things to notice here is that this is page 608 in the book. The book is about 1,000 pages long. Um, and at that point, we actually do the derivation of the matched filter, uh, which is a crucial component if you want to do digital communications of uh, just transmitting text or images or things like that. So you basically have to go through a whole bunch of mathematics like this here for maybe three quarters of the semester before you actually get to see what you can do with communications. And that has been a stumbling block for many students. Um, they tend to drop the class when they see the mass and, and don't see what, the, what it could be applied for. So what we want to do is we want to turn this around and actually show first what can we do with communications and then gradually introduce the mass that is needed for that. We're not going to do away with the mass, we just want to introduce it in a more natural manner. And the way we're trying to do this is we are um, looking at the digital communication system in four acts, uh, basically an intuitive way of how we would do communications if you wanted to transmit the text from one place to another place, either wired or wirelessly. And we break this up into those four acts, uh, parallel to serial and then serial to parallel conversion. Um, most of you have been enough into communications that you know that this is one of the fundamental things that needs to be done. For students, that is something new initially. Then we need to go from discrete time to continuous time because most natural uh, radio channels are actually continuous or analog in nature, or actually both continuous and analog. Then um, any interesting communication scenario involves noise. Uh, if there would be no noise, there would, we wouldn't really actually have to be sitting here because communication would be trivial. Okay, so we have to add that at some point in time. And then we, we see that that has actually quite an effect on the communication, a negative effect uh, for that matter. And then we start talking about how could we maximize the signal to noise ratio. And that actually brings us back to that page 608 in the book which we do much earlier, we start, we recognize there is a problem and then we can start introducing the mathematics and work on it and figure out what is our best way of dealing with that. Okay, so um, the first part will be relatively detailed uh, and some of it I've been talking about on Monday already, so uh, bear with me. We start out with making a source, a vector source, and we don't just want to have random data, we want to have an actual text so that you can see once you have received that you actually received the same text. Okay, so we, we put in some ASCII code here. I chose the, the word zombie. And then we convert that to, to serial by using a, a regular block in the GNU radio uh, framework. Uh, a throttle so that the whole thing is, is uh, just operating at the fixed rate and doesn't run away because it's all running just in software. And then we want to see what the result is at this stage. That's not going to be a text yet. That's just going to be samples. And in order to do that, we need to convert from, from bytes uh, to floating point numbers because the QT GUI time sync can only accept either real numbers or complex numbers, not bytes or integers. Okay, and so here's what it looks like. Uh, for many of you, that's going to look familiar. Uh, we have zeros and ones, so it's a binary transmission, and uh, the zombie starts from 5a hexadecimal 6f, and if you use LSB first, that's uh, the digital um, bits that you're going to transmit, and that's uh, lo looking like that when you have a, a stem plot. In order to make a stem plot in GNU Radio, you actually have to use the middle mouse button uh, to, to adjust the properties of the QT GUI time sync. Okay, another thing to note here is that we are putting a tag in so that we can actually see um, at which point the, the text starts. The text um, repeats over and over again, so we need to be able to synchronize to that, and the tag is a very handy uh, resource for that. Okay, then uh, once we 
uh, can do that, we realize that uh, a more general scenario for going from parallel to serial would involve some more parameters. Like uh, how many bits are you going to take per symbol? Um, are you going to take those bits positive or negative? Are you going to make polar or unipolar signals and so forth? There's a whole bunch of things and those are parameters up here. So we're creating now a hierarchical block that can then be used for all the other scenarios and we'll just make a single block with all those parameters that can be selected either by using um, uh, GUI widgets or, or by just uh, presetting it to a particular value that we need for something. And just uh, very shortly, here is the input into this hierarchical module, here is the output. And then um, we can, we have here the change from polar to unipolar, so either we make all uh, positive numbers or we make positive and negative numbers. Then the, we make the ones complement in case the bits get inverted during transmission. That's something that um, happens frequently in transmissions. And then here is the, the place where we uh, convert the, the parallel bytes that we transmit into either bits or pairs of bits or triplets of bits and so forth. So once we have this block, we can then include it in a in a regular you know, new radio flow graph as just one block. And the idea here is that first we have looked at the details of what's inside that block. Once we understand that, then we don't want to deal with all the details every time. We just make it into a block and put it in there and then continue investigating other things. Okay, so here we, we do the, actually the, first, the same thing again as we did in the first slide. We take our vector source, the text, and we take a look at what that looks like at the output, so for variation, I'm showing here the graphs when you put now two bits per symbol so that you get, uh, for polar symbols, you get uh, this scenario, minus three, minus one, plus one, and plus three. For unipolar signals, you get zero, one, two, and three. And we can select on the fly, as we demonstrate this in class or as the students work with it, we can um, show on the fly what the difference between polar and unipolar is. This is just, um, has just been the, put the two pictures together, but in the, in the live simulation, we would just select between the two. And then, of course, uh, at the receiving end, we need to undo this parallel to serial uh, conversion and do a serial to parallel conversion that has similar parameters, again, uh, as we had for the parallel to serial conversion, with the exception that there is a gain in front of it so that we can adjust for uh, loss during transmission. And there is a, a delay a block in here that's back here, a symbol delay, because at the receiving end, we need to synchronize with respect to the 8-bit structure of the ASCII code. So if we just see a bit, we don't know whether that's the first bit in the ASCII code or second bit or third bit. In order to adjust for that, we have the delay parameter here so that we can uh, synchronize to the ASCII. And so now we have an end-to-end -end, uh, discrete time baseband communication system where we have a vector source. Uh, again, the, the, the zombie text is in here. Then we have the parallel to serial block, the serial to parallel block, the swaddle in between to, to um, adjust the rate, the Q QT GUI time sync to just look at the signal. And then we have a file sync um, where we can actually see the text. So I'm just simply using a terminal in, in Linux and uh, type TTY to see what, uh, what the address is of that terminal, and then it gets displayed in that terminal. Okay, so I'll just show you what that looks like. I, I'm not gonna run this um, real time. I have some other things that I will be able to run real time so that we can take a look at it. But basically the students now get to see here uh, a polar binary signal. They can adjust the symbol delay here to synchronize so that they get the text out and they get to see that text in that, um, a terminal window. And basically, you can see that you know, there might be actually something to communications. You go from your text, you, you make those binary symbols, and then you go back to your text again. So there is some amount of motivation of doing this uh, rather than having just random data transmitted and checking that random data is coming out again. Okay, now the next step is to actually convert this discrete time system or the discrete time transmission into continuous time transmission. And for that, we're gonna use pulse amplitude modulation. So we start introducing some formulas. We start working with Fourier transform. 
we look at different pulses that we might be able to use, so rectangular, triangular, and a sync pulse, and we then apply Fourier transforms to that to show that this uses the widest bandwidth, uh, this is next in bandwidth, and this is the most narrow bandwidth that you can use for uh, a given transmission speed. So now, when we go from discrete time to continuous time, there is a little bit of a problem because everything we do here is, is actually in the discrete time domain. Anything that you're going to run on GNU radio or, or you know, on a computer for that matter is going to be discrete time and not continuous time. And so the way we handle that is we just say discrete time is sort of the original rate, the original baud rate or symbol rate that we use. And then the, the, the continuous time simulation is done by just using a higher sampling rate. Okay? In this particular case, uh, in, in this block here, the, the default is set to two. Uh, this is samples per symbol. Uh, that is sufficient for just doing communications, but for making nice pictures, that's not sufficient. So we usually put then a value of 10 or so when we are uh, using this hierarchical block. Okay, but the default is, is just set to the two here. And so uh, one of the things we discuss in, this co in connection with that is that we have to do upsampling when we uh, work in, in GNU radio or in, or in general when we do simulations of um, uh, software-defined radio things. Uh, and uh, that's something students in principle have heard in a linear systems class, but they usually don't get it at that point in time. So here is, a, is an application where you can actually really use that. Okay, otherwise, um, actually there's one thing I should uh, still talk about. Of course, when you go from discrete time to continuous time, we somehow need to shape the, uh, the waveform and uh, we do that in this interpolating FIR filter. So that gets filter taps that depend on whether we want to do rectangular pulses or triangular pulses or sync pulses or uh, race cosine and frequency. Actually, here they are listed, those pulses. And that actually comes in, in into uh, this place here by importing um, this PF. So that's uh, uh, a Python function that we that we have written and that we import and that contains the samples that are needed uh, or the taps that are needed for this filter in order to make the different pulse shapes. Okay, so here is an example of that file uh, that has to go in there. So that's one of the things that students learn along the way to, to work with Python and make um, uh, some of those filter coefficients for FIR filters. Okay, then um, we get to the point where we now have uh, uh, ASCII uh, transmission using pulse amplitude modulation and then somehow at the receiving end, of course, we need to pick out uh, what we want to use to recover the text. And the most intuitive way of doing things, of going from discrete time to continuous time, is to just simply uh, take the discrete time pulse and just extend it for the period of time that's necessary for uh, a bit transmission and then at the receiving end, we just simply uh, pick one of those samples that we are receiving. So that's what is referred to here as an impulse sampling. Okay, so what we're trying to do here is to uh, make it intuitive enough that the students can see, yeah, that might be a reasonable first way to look at, at things. So we do that, and um, we get the result that looks something like this. Uh, we have... Um, here the spectrum of the signal, uh, we have uh, selectors here where we can select rectangular, triangular, raised cosine frequency and so forth pulses. So those are the typical pulses one would use. Uh, we can see it uses a wide bandwidth for the rectangular pulses. Then over here we can see in blue the actual pulses that get transmitted. So those are the continuous time signal and then in red is that impulse sampling where we just pick out um, one sample uh, for each um, time, bit time interval uh, in order to recover the text again. And we do, of course, get the text. We don't have any noise or anything added here. There are no impairments. So we definitely should be getting things back. We need to be able to adjust, in this case, the sample delay. So that means that, you know, the red dots that you see here, you can move those left or right by, choosing, by selecting the sample delay and then the symbol delay in order to synchronize with the 8-bit structure of the ASCII code. Okay, uh, here is the same thing if we have an RCF pulse, that's raised cosine frequency that's similar to a sync pulse, it's a little bit uh, modified sync pulse. 
you can see that you know there are overshoots here um, of, of that RCF pulse that's in order to minimize the bandwidth and you can see that the bandwidth is much uh, more narrow here than it was um, uh, on the previous picture. Okay, if we go back here once more, this is the bandwidth with rectangular pulses that we are getting and here it is um, with using the sync type pulses. Okay, now here it is more crucial that we uh, select the, the sampling delay uh, correctly. This is the perfect uh, sampling time. If it's not so perfect, then it's gonna look like this. And uh, you start getting some errors. Uh, probably if we look at this closely, there might be a few errors in here. So this is a misaligned symbol timing at the receiving end. But we can adjust that by using those sliders up here. Okay, so now comes the question, what happens if you're adding noise? Okay, so in the, in the diagram, in the flow graph of the whole thing, we have now our vector source, we have the, S, uh, the parallel to serial conversion, the throttle, the PAM transmitter where the wave shapes are made, and then we add noise to it. And then we have the, the received noisy signal here that goes back. Uh, it goes through a delay here, so which is the delay which we actually use for sampling at the right time. And then there is a decimating uh, filter here so that we uh, um, are going back from continuous time to discrete time. We basically have to, uh, every SPS sample, samples per symbol, we have to pick out one impulse here. And you can see that the decimation factor is 10, so I've been choosing a sampling, uh, uh, samples per symbol factor of 10 in order to go from discrete time to continuous time and back. And then we go back through the serial to parallel conversion and display the text here. There is some additional stuff in here. There is another interpolating filter in here because what we want to do uh, in this block back here is we want to be able to see at the same time what we have on the channel. So that's the signal that comes out here. And also where we are actually sampling the signal and the QT GUI time sync does not work well if you have two inputs, if you give um, a different uh, sampling rates at the two inputs. You have to make the sampling rate the same and that's why we increase the sampling rate here again after having reduced it just for the sake of being able to display it. Okay, so here's what that looks like. And now with noise, you can see that uh, here, th th this is again the rectangular waveform. So this is the main uh, lobe here of the spectrum. And then out to the right and to the left, you see basically the noise floor that has gone up. I can adjust that by uh, changing here the amplitude of the noise uh, back and forth, making noise less over here and putting a lot of noise over there. And here now, things um, start looking pretty hairy. Uh, the blue is the waveform that we receive with the noise uh, on top of it. But the red are those individual samples that we are picking. We are still just doing impulse sampling and we pick one sample. And if that sample happens to be uh, affected a lot by the noise, then um, think we're gonna create an error. And you can see here in the receive text what that looks like you can still, knowing that zombie is transmitted, you can probably still guess that that was from zombie. But um, if that was just a message that you had no clue about, you wouldn't be able to decipher that. Okay, and so at this point, we're basically asking the question, is it possible to do better than that? You know, if we have 10 samples available and we're just picking one out of those at the receiving end and base our decision on that, is that a good idea or is it not? And uh, most of the students realized by that time that's maybe not such a good idea. And maybe we can do better if we average somehow over samples. And so we, we uh, you know, pondered the idea, should we use maybe a low pass filter or something like that? So it's something you can try within the GNU radio framework uh, to use a low pass filter and see what that does. And, uh, and that does give an improvement, but it's not the best thing to do yet. So now we go back to basically the theory and make a block diagram and say, well, here's our pulse amplitude modulation. Here's the channel. Then there is noise added that's typically all considered to be part of the channel. And then at the receiving end, we're now just saying we need to have some sort of a filter before we do that sampling at the end here. And 
Then we get, of course, into some of the mathematics. That's actually some of that stuff from page 608 in the textbook that I showed you. And we have to figure out uh, what is the exact expected signal power at the receiving end without noise, what is the expected noise power without the signal, so that we can compute the signal-to-noise ratio at the receiver. So that's uh, the formula here at the bottom. The signal power is here in, in the numerator. The noise power is in the denominator. And um, th this uh, starts looking formidable for, for many of the students, but at least you know we have seen there might be some need for actually looking at that and, and trying to deal with it. So the, the scary thing at this point is that we're going to say, well, this HR of F, that's what characterizes our receiver. So we're going to take now this big formula here and we're going to maximize uh, the, the signal to noise ratio by choosing what this HR of F is. So this HR of F appears here in the numerator. The whole thing is magnitude squared. There is also something in the denominator, magnitude squared. And ordinarily, that would not be something that's easy to solve. But we are lucky in this particular case. There is something like uh, the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality uh, that we invoke at that point in time. I'm skipping the details here. Um, in the end, you can actually truly um, mathematically maximize the signal to noise ratio and you come out with uh, a specification of the receiving filter that looks like that which to many of you is of course known as the matched filter. Okay, it's like um, if you have a, a power source and then you have a load to the power source people talk about the matched load which extracts most of the power out of that um, source that, that you can give in the source and here we are just trying to extract most of the signal power out of the transmitted signal while minimizing the, what we are extracting from the noise power. Okay, so here we do for a while a little bit of mathematics, then we go back in here and now we say we can now make um, a hierarchical block that actually implements this matched filter. And then later we can just toss that in and we don't have to every time uh, draw all those blocks here, we just have the parameters that we can adjust. So the matched filter itself is basically another FIR filter. In this case, it's a, de a decimating FIR filter because we are going to reduce the sampling rate um, at the output. We need the, the delays again because we need to, to do the, the, the sampling at exactly the right time. So this filter actually does all the convolutions uh, before the sampling and then the delay here basically uh, picks out the, the right sample that we are needing. Um, here is the main output here that, um, uh, let's see, which one is the output? No, th this one here is the, okay, so the decimation actually truly happens in this filter here after the delay. Um, this one here has a decimation of one, so this is truly just an FIR filter. Here is the decimation that goes by the factor of 10. It's a default of two here, but we, will, we usually use a factor of 10. And then here is the actual output from which we then go to the serial to parallel conversion. But we have two more outputs here. One, so that we can see what's actually happening at the output of the match filter. Uh, that's this one up here. And then another one here where we can see what's happening at the output of, the, of that decimating FIR filter. And we again interpolate here because we want to have the same um, sampling rate on this one as we have on this one so that we can display those two uh, on, a, uh, on, on a time sink uh, or, or uh, on a GUI time sink uh, simultaneously. And we need to have the same sampling rates for the two. Okay, so now we have an optimized uh, pulse amplitude modulation communication system. So that's still a baseband system. We have now our vector source again, uh, uh, ser uh, parallel to serial conversion. Then we have the uh, pulse amplitude modulation transmitter. We add noise to it. Here is the received noisy signal that goes now into the pulse amplitude modulated modulation receiver. Here is the main output that goes uh, to the terminal that displays the text. And then we have uh, those two outputs which we put into the uh, time sink. Basically, we're looking at it uh, in a, on an oscilloscope. Okay, and so now uh, we, I use the same settings here for the, um, for the noise. And uh, as I used in the previous picture with the impulse sampling, and we can now see the text is perfectly readable. 
and we have a lot, a lot less um, uh, variation here at the receiving end because we go through that match filter. Okay, there is a live version of that which I'm going to skip um, right now. You can actually uh, find that on, on YouTube um, and, and play with it. Uh, what I want to point out still is uh, where do we go from here? So the next steps uh, would be use amplitude modulation to convert to a bandpass signal and then look at the effects of the frequency and phase errors between transmitter and receiver. And I'm going to show you uh, what that looks like. So this, this is the whole block diagram for that. The additional things in here are the AM transmitter and the AM receiver so that we put this onto a carrier. And uh, you can see here is the signal on the carrier, so the positive and the negative frequencies. Then we have now new adjustments. We have the carrier frequency that we can vary and we have the error in the carrier frequency that we can vary. And so I'm going to try and show you the live version of that, if that works here. Uh, there is some sound with it. I don't know if the sound will come through or not. So we'll have to see. Uh, I can hear the sound here on my computer, but um, I don't know if the, the sound will come otherwise. But the, the sound basically mimics what's happening here with the signal. So here is the signal. Um, we are changing now to the RRCF pulse, so we have more narrow bandwidth. And the next thing that's going to happen is that we change the carrier frequency here. And you can see how this moves out because we now have a higher carrier frequency. Down here, you can see the text as it is received. And um, you can hear how the sound goes higher. Then we add noise to it. And you can see over here that it's now becoming more shaky with the noise. The text is still doing very well because we're using the matched filter. And then the last step will be that we are going to now introduce a frequency error between transmitter and receiver. Once this is back, uh, the next step is to now introduce frequency error. And it's a small frequency error. It's about half a hertz or less than that. And you can see that now uh, what's happening. Uh, for those of you who know, basically the constellation now rotates and it goes from the cosine channel to the sine channel and so forth. And of course, uh, by that time, we realize we need to do something about that synchronization. You know, even if you have the, uh, I mean, if you trans, it doesn't matter whether you transmit in the gigahertz range or, or down in the megahertz range. If you are half a hertz off uh, between transmitter and receiver, you're going to get that effect. And so that then leads us to the step of introducing um, a complex valued receiver so that we can see both the sine and the cosine channel. So that was um, my contribution here. I guess the next slide is just questions, and I'm guessing you are also just saying questions. That is right. <coughs> Dan has a question. By the way, while Jose is walking over, I'd like to remind everyone that um, Peter and also the next two authors or presenters have also authored a paper, which you can download on pubs.greenradio.org. It looks like you're, um, in, in most of these demos, you, you have a fixed slider that allows the students to basically uh, do the clock synchronization. Is that something, are you planning to, to teach how to do that automatically? Because that's yep, the that thing comes, that. That comes uh, after that. Uh, I, what I want explicitly to do is I want the students to get the feel for that, of what that means, rather than just give them a block and say, well, this is going to do it for you. So the next step, actually, after what I just showed here, and then the complex valid signals, that is to look at synchronization and how can we solve that problem. No more questions? The next speaker could please come up to the stage. Ah, oh, there he is, just came in. Fantastic. Actually, um, I have a question. Do you have okay. any success stories out of the out of the classroom? Like, do you students like this? Uh, have you taught this class without this, and do you notice a difference? Uh, so this semester is the first time that I'm teaching the theory class with New Radio. I've been teaching our lab class with New Radio, and that was quite successful actually. The students were initially a little hesitant to have to learn Python because they usually know MATLAB more than they do Python. Um, but I try very much in the beginning to help them uh, with it and debug everything. And uh, once, uh, once they are finished with it, they 
they, they think it's great. And a lot of them actually came back from internships and said it helped them a lot to be able to do those kind of things. As someone who hires uh, engineers, I'm very happy that you are helping uh, give people a real hands-on. Okay, speaking of hands, please give Peter a hand and.